Greetings again, everybody. Welcome back to our endocrine talks here. We're going to talk about the posterior pituitary, specifically disorders of the posterior pituitary. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or in the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And if you haven't, definitely feel free to subscribe to my channel and you'll get updates as I put more and more videos up. I try to do anywhere from three to five a week. Okay, so in a previous video, we talked about the anterior pituitary. That just in general is higher yield because there are more disorders, um, especially as it pertains to uh, step two and three. Uh, however, the posterior pituitary does have two hormones, but really only one of them is relevant for disorders of the posterior pituitary, and that's ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Uh, now, both of these hormones, ADH and oxytocin, are actually made in the hypothalamus, and then they come down through that infundibulum, that pituitary stock, and then are stored in the posterior pituitary. So it's not exactly correct to say that these are posterior pituitary hormones. They're actually hypothalamic hormones. They just get stored in the posterior pituitary. And we'll talk about SIADH and diabetes insipidus. So uh, let's just briefly uh, talk about what ADH does. ADH has two major functions. However, the more relevant function for our purposes here is that it tells cells at the collecting duct of the nephron to insert aquaporins. Aquaporins are channels that allow the kidney to pull water back into the bloodstream. Okay, so you resorb water. What does that mean? Well, because you're reabsorbing free water, you are going to replace your, uh, your, your, your blood volume, right? Um, but at the same time, because you're just reabsorbing free water, no sodium, no other electrolytes, it will have a dilutional effect, Okay, so what that means then is that you are going to have a low plasma osmolality and a low serum sodium, even though you're not wasting sodium. There are other causes of hyponatremia where you waste sodium, you're losing body sodium, not happening here. Your total uh, sodium by mass, I guess if you want to put it that way, is normal. Uh, but you have a dilution, kind of similar to that dilutional anemia that you see in pregnancy due to the higher circulating blood volume. And well, naturally, with SIADH, you're going to have a low volume of urine because you're just concentrating the urine like crazy, pulling water out of the kidneys, and you'll have a higher urine osmolality, uh, basically the complete opposite situation going on in the urine. Uh, so... SIADH is a euvolemic hyponatremia. Um, this is not hypervolemia. Um, so you think of conditions there like congestive heart failure where you have an increase in blood volume, um, but that will cause a hypervolemic hyponatremia and then causes of uh, hyponatremia that are um, where, where you have a, uh, a hypovolemia. So there uh, we're, we're talking about uh, other things, which by the way, I do have a table here for you. Um, you can print this out if you want, um, but uh, I'm not going to go into the hypovolemia versus hypervolemia. Suffice it to say that uh, you can tell the difference between these two clinically. I mean, hyp hypervolemia, they're going to be edematous, they're going to have uh, uh, adventitious lung sounds, pulmonary edema, and so forth. Hypovolemia, poor capillary refill, sunken eyes, decreased skin turgor. Uh, you get the you you get the idea. This is just clinical medicine here, um, and so you can see there are some very common causes like GI fluid loss, sweating sweating and burns, dehydration, and then congestive heart failure. Of course, we're talking here about SIADH. That's a euvolemic hyponatremia. Okay, so let's go back here. Um, so this just outlines the mechanism, which we already talked about. The major causes are head trauma and malignancy, particularly small cell lung cancer and pancreatic cancer. Um, so for that reason, as you're going to see, we're going to have a little bit of a workup even after we diagnose SIADH. Clinically, these patients are euvolemic. They are often asymptomatic, so this could be an incidental finding when you get a BMP for some other reason. Uh, however, 
on the test, they're probably going to give you a, a symptomatic patient. And the symptoms of hyponatremia are neurologic. So it's altered mental status. Um, headaches and nausea can be early on. It can go on to vomiting and seizures and ultimately coma and death. Um, so to diagnose this, it's really going to depend on how they present. Obviously, if they're asymptomatic, you are going to find it on the BMP. Uh, you'll find the, uh, the hyponatremia. Uh, if they come in with altered mental status, you have to always get BMP. And that goes for everyone. You always need to get electrolytes in any patient who has got altered mental status because it is electrolyte abnormalities that are a huge cause of AMS. So we're gonna get BMP and a urinalysis. We wanna check the electrolytes not only in the serum, but in the urine. And again, that, that just ties back to if you're thinking of an electrolyte abnormality, yes, of course, it's great to get serum electrolytes, but you also wanna get urine electrolytes because you wanna find out, are you losing these electrolytes in the urine? The whole point of the urine, aside to get rid of excess fluid, is to get rid of excess electrolytes. And so you wanna see if everything is on the up and up with the uh, kidneys. Now, with SIADH, the urine sodium will be inappropriately high. Well, okay, what does that mean? Well, since you have a hyponatremia, should you be peeing out sodium? No, of course not. Sodium is a valuable commodity in a hyponatremic. And so we expect the urine sodium to be low as well. If the urine sodium is high, uh, then what that means is either we are wasting sodium or we are over-concentrated. And that's what's happening in uh, SIADH. So remember, there's two ways to get a higher concentration. You can either pull water out or you can put solutes in, right? Basic chemistry. Um, so what we see is an inappropriately high uh, concentration of urine, and that's telling you that there is a problem at the level of the kidney. Um, either the, uh, the, you have too much ADH or there's something going on elsewhere. Uh, so again, this is due to high urinary concentration. Uh, it is not due to, uh, to high sodium uh, or low sodium resorption. So this is a, it's, SIADH is a problem with water, okay? Sodium, this, the hyponatremia is just a manifestation. This is a problem with water resorption. Okay, too much water resorption. The most accurate test for SIADH is a serum ADH. I think you can remember that one. Okay, this is kind of a diagnostic algorithm for hyponatremia. I go into this in the renal talk, so you can go back and watch that if you want. Now, the treatment depends on the symptoms. If they're asymptomatic, we can just fluid restrict them, make sure that they're, uh, that they're, they're getting less fluid than they're peeing out. That's kind of the point. We want to reduce the amount of water in their serum. If they're moderately symptomatic, so the nonspecific things like nausea, vomiting, headache, um, just do normal saline and furosemide. Um, why furosemide? Um, well, that uh, there's there's a number of reasons. I'm not going to go into that, but you can look as to why you use loop diuretics specifically in SIADH. Uh, you also want to closely follow the electrolyte levels. Anytime you're you're correcting an electrolyte abnormality, you want to frequently check electrolyte levels every three to six hours. If they're severely asymptomatic, that is when we start the hypertonic saline. So a lot of people think, oh, wow, you've got a serum sodium of 121. I'm going to wire you up to 3% uh, sodium chloride. Do not do that. Okay, why do we not do that? Because it depends. Okay, how low someone's serum sodium level is can manifest in different ways depending on how fast it came on. You could have a close to normal serum sodium, but if it was a precipitous drop, let's say you drop from 138 to 126 in the matter of, uh, you know, three days or two days even, um, that you could, you, you could have severe symptoms from that. On the other hand, if let's say you went from baseline 135 to now 117, but it happened over the course of a year, you might not have symptoms from that. I mean, eventually you will, but uh, it depends on how long it came on, all right? Now, another important thing, and this I can't stress enough, you've got to be very slow 
uh, with your replacement. So ideally, no more than eight points per day. Um, there are a lot of things that go into this um, as far as, you know, do we want to go fast? Do we want to go slow? You have to weigh the, you, you have to weigh your options. If the patient is severely symptomatic, then yeah, you want to work a little bit faster. However, you run the risk of working too fast and the complication of a fast correction of hyponatremia is central pontine myelinolysis. So you need to be very careful. And then we want to find the underlying cause. Um, so uh, remember pancreatic and lung cancer are two big causes. So CT head and uh, CT abdomen and chest x-ray. And then the CT head is gotten because uh, of head trauma being a common cause as well. Okay, this is a table that you can print out if you want. Okay, now diabetes insipidus is, uh, it's called diabetes because there's tons of urine, okay? You're just peeing tons and tons. So polyuria and then consequently polydipsia because these patients get dehydrated. That's what we mean by diabetes. Otherwise, it's nothing to do with, you know, the type 1 and type 2 diabetes. With diabetes mellitus, type 1 and type 2, the problem is sugar. With diabetes insipidus, the problem is water and sodium. So a lot of times these patients will have hypernatremia because they are dehydrated. Uh, however, this is also a problem with ADH. In particular here, it's unlike SIADH where you had too much, here we either have too little or we're not responding. Now, what we would see just based on the patient's clinical presentation is that they are dehydrated, but they're peeing a lot. That doesn't make any sense. The other place we see that is with diabetes mellitus. If a person is dehydrated, they should have very concentrated urine and, and not very much of it. With these patients, they're dehydrated, but they keep peeing. That is going to tip you off to DI. Now, the question then, are we making ADH? Do we have enough ADH? Because that would cause diabetes insipidus. Or do we have it, but we don't know what to do with it? We can't respond to it. This gives us our two different kinds of DI. Central DI just means we have a low ADH. Nephrogenic DI means we have ADH, but the kidneys don't respond to them. They are clinically identical in presentation. And so we will diagnose this. You can either get an ADH level, but classically we do a water deprivation test. Now, there are a variety of causes. The big ones here, if you're dealing with a central DI and you know it, then think trauma or tumor. If you are dealing with a nephrogenic DI, think of drugs. Lithium is the big one. Why? Because it's so commonly used. Okay, so again, here are the symptoms. It's pretty obvious based on history. Um, obviously, you should get labs, uh, serum, and urine electrolytes. Um, now, if the patient is severely hypernatremic, then we start hypotonic fluids. Similar to in severe hyponatremia, we start hypertonic fluids. And again, we want to be judicious here uh, because here the complication is cerebral edema. Uh, so we want to be very careful. We will correct at about 0 0.5 to 1 milli equivalent per liter per hour, or points per hour. Okay, the, the, uh, the test that we can do here is the water deprivation test. Uh, and that will help us distinguish um, the different causes of, of DI or really of, uh, of polyuria. Um, so uh, let's say, uh, let, let's look here at this chart. So we have plasma osmolality here, urine osmolality here. You can see there's a linear correlation with normal, and that's because the more concentrated the plasma is, the more concentrated we expect the urine to be. Um, so we have this roughly linear relationship uh, with normal. What you can see here with DI is that, well, we're right here, so we have a really concentrated plasma, but our urine is very unconcentrated. That's exactly what you see in DI, okay? Now, let's say that we administer ADH. I'm going to try to change my pen here. So administer desmopressin or ADH or one of its gazillion names. Uh, well, let's say now that you have something like this. And now th keep in mind, this is not over time. Uh, what you're doing here is you're just comparing the plasma osmolality to the urine osmolality. Now let's say you're something like this after giving ADH. What kind of DI are you dealing with here? 
This would be central. The problem here was the lack of ADH. You give it, everything's fine. What you would see is once you give the ADH, immediately the, uh, the, the urine flow stops, okay? It's like you turn the nozzle. Um, and so that's central DI. If there's no correction, then you know you're dealing with nephrogenic DI because you've given ADH and it's not working. Okay, so this is, again, just kind of going over the pathophysiology here and the differences. Uh, so again, we do the water deprivation test. It's supervised. If they concentrate, um, so if they concentrate without giving any ADH during the test, then you just dealt with polydipsia. And that could be, you know, psychogenic, could be malingering, Munchausen's, whatever. If there's no concentration, then you administer ADH or DDAVP, same thing. Uh, if you get concentration, then it was a central. If no concentration, it was a nephrogenic. For central DI, obviously the medical treatment is DDAVP. We're just giving what we gave during the test. If it's nephrogenic DI, then we actually give hydrochlorothiazide. Why do we give a diuretic for someone who's peeing too much? I don't understand it either. I'm, I'm sure there's a reason. You can look it up, uh, but it's just something you put in the back of your mind. Nephrogenic DI, hydrochlorothiazide, and or amylaride. And again, if these patients are admitted, make sure that you're following their, uh, their serum sodium like a hawk. Um, unfortunately with, or maybe fortunately with hypo and hypernatremia, the symptoms are, there, there's a lot of overlap. It's altered mental status. It's different from hyper and hypo uh, calcemia, where you're going to get radically different symptoms depending on whether you're dealing with hyper and hypo. So uh, you you deal with these, you've got a lot of um, uh, non-specific, even asymptomatic presentations. Labs are really going to help you. Sometimes you find, the, find these uh, incidentally.